Hello and welcome to this, our video on two-step experiments. And like any lame math jokes, what do you notice here? Oh yes, two steps. They don't get much better than this, I promise you. In fact, they will never get better than this because that's probably some of my best material. Now, I suppose when we look at the title, it says they're experiments. And where have we met the word experiment in probability before? Oh yes, experimental probability, which was very closely tied to theoretical probability. Do you remember what that was all about? Well, when we look at theoretical probability, we know the probability of getting a head on a standard coin should be a half. And the probability of getting a tail on a standard coin should be a half. Why? Because there is one head out of two outcomes. Now that's theoretical. Experimental probability is where we actually do experiments to test what actually happens. Now, why don't you take a coin and toss it 100 times. If the theory is correct, you should get 50 heads and you should get 50 tails. But I can almost guarantee that that's not what you're going to get. You might get close and to be honest with you, you might get 50-50 the first time you do it. But repeat it again and the chances are you won't. So experimentally, the probabilities might be slightly different from the theoretical. And there's lots of factors about that, but we are running ahead of ourselves. So what is this two-step experiment? Well, previously we've looked at rolling one dice, picking one letter, picking one playing card, or tossing one coin. And when we're doing things with only one roll, one throw, one choice, etc., they're called single-step experiments. So everything we've done so far has probably been single-step experiments. But what about if we do two things, like what if we were to toss two coins or roll two dice? Well, they there are called two-step experiments. Why? Because we're doing two different things, right? We're taking two cards, we're choosing two dice or rolling two things or, you know. So um, if we recap slightly from this, you know, one-step stuff, when we have one step, we have a head and a tail from the toss of a coin. We have the numbers one to six from rolling a fair die. And we have the, uh, the colors red, white, and blue from the French flag. And actually, we can use the information from possible outcomes from one-step experiments to help us with our two-step experiments. And probably one of the easier ones that we can deal with is throwing two coins. So now in this situation, it's not particularly difficult to try and find all the list of the possible outcomes. If we think about coin one and coin two, then we can have a head on the first and head on the second, head and tail, tail and head, and tail and tail. Now actually, the way we've expressed it here in the form of a table is actually pretty awesome. But there are other ways of actually showing this information, and I'll come back to that in a second. Now, here, we notice that we have four outcomes, which is easy for uh, two coins. But how many outcomes would we have if we had three coins? Well, I'm gonna tell you now, it's actually equal to out eight outcomes. Whoa, what about four coins? Well, actually, there are 16 outcomes. And five coins would actually give you 32, six coins would give you 64, and there's actually a bit of a pattern here. And it has to do with those single outcomes. Well, let's just bear that in mind. So if I had one coin, we worked out there was two anchor, two coins are four outcomes, three coins there are eight outcomes. Now, how many outcomes are there from just one coin? There are two. When we have two coins, we end up with two times two. Three coins, we end up with two times two times two, which is eight. Times that again by two, we get 16. Times by two, we get 32. And that's the pattern. Knowing the single possible outcomes or the possible outcomes for a one-step experiment helps us find the two-step. But again, we're, uh, we're rushing. So what if I roll a die and throw a coin? Mm, well, that's going to come back in a moment. But... If we know the single step outcomes, and we know for a coin, it's head and tail, and for a die, it's one, two, three, four, five, and six, I already know that because there's a two outcomes there, and there's six outcomes there, that if I take these two and times them together, then I'm actually gonna end up with, I'm actually gonna end up with 12 outcomes. Whoa. So hold on a moment, as an aside, if I have something with seven possible outcomes, and another one with nine possible outcomes, 
Then how many outcomes are there in total? Well, you just multiply the nine and the seven to give me 63 possible outcomes. That's a lot of outcomes, but it actually helps us plan what's happening. So we're talking about take, making a table to show the results. We could have actually said that for coin one, we get heads and tails, and for coin two, we get heads and tails, and actually write it in a table like this. So these are the outcomes from coin number one, and these are the outcomes from coin number two, which give me head and a head, head and a tail, tail and a head, and a tail and a tail, which actually happen to be exactly the same as the outcomes here, but just in a different way. And generally speaking, this is probably a nicer way of doing it. So we've decided that it has something to do with uh, possible outcomes. And we know the outcomes of rolling a dice are heads and tails. This helps us create the table. And then we've got these six outcomes from rolling a coin. So in the same way as we did before, let's draw a table. All right, so one, two, three, four, five, and six. And so this one here is our dice. And then we've got heads and tails for our coin. So this box basically stands for what would happen with the die and the coin. And because we're in the heads row and the one column, this is going to be a head and a one. This is going to be a head and a two. Head and a three. Head and a four. Head and a five. Head and a six. This is going to be a tail and a one. Tail and a two. Tail and a three tail and a four, tail and a five, tail and a six. And as we can see, if we count the number of outcomes, how many do we have? Oh yes, we have 12 outcomes, which is what we're expecting, remember. Two for heads and tails, six for the coins, multiply them together and we have 12 outcomes. Now, people always ask me, why did we put the dice on the top and the coin down the side? And I always say, actually, it doesn't matter. You can do them in any order you like. You could have had the coin up the side, uh, sorry, along the top, and the dice down the side. Right? It doesn't actually matter. I just think the table looks better this way, so I'm going to put better with a smiley face. All right? And then people say, well, does that mean a tail followed by a three? And I like say, nope. It just means that I've got a tail and a three. Whether we get the three first followed by the tail, or we have the tail first followed by the three, order isn't actually important. So this now helps us answer our probability questions. So firstly, find the probability of a head, comma, one. That means find the probability of getting a head and a one. Well, how many heads and ones are there? There is one out of 12 possible outcomes. So that's head and one. Probability of a head and any number. All right, so a head and any number. Well, that's one, two, three, four, five, six outcomes out of 12, which we must remember to cancel down. What about the probability of getting a tail and a five? Well, there's only one of those. Again, one out of 12 outcomes. A tail and a seven? Ah, trick question. Because there is no number seven on our dice, there is absolutely no chance of having this at all, which means it is a probability of, oh yes, zero. What about getting the probability of a head and a tail? Again, that probability is going to be zero. Why? Because we're not throwing two coins. So, yeah, we're throwing a dice and a coin. And then finally, what is the probability of getting a tail and an odd number? So now we're going to look for all the tail and odd numbers. Not that that's one. So there is one, two, and three. So that's three out of 12, which is one out of four. So there's a quarter chance. Now, drawing this table actually makes finding probabilities really easy for us, right? So my advice to you is, where possible, try and draw this. All right? It's a sample space diagram. It's a list of possible outcomes. It's all sorts of different stuff just to help us list all the possible outcomes. So here's an example from the Cambridge textbook. No infringement of copyright was intended, but it's a really good question to demonstrate things. So we have a spinner with the numbers 1, 2, and 3. So I'm going to write that now. Spinner with the numbers 1, 2, and 3. So there's three outcomes. And I've got a word, A-T-H-S. All right, so that's got the A, the T, the H, and the S, which is four possible outcomes. So we now know there will be 12 outcomes in total. Well, yay! Drawing my table, let's have the letters here, A, T, H, and S, and then the numbers 1, 
2 and 3. So when we fill in all this, that means A1, T1, H1, S1, A2, T2, H2, S2, and A3, T3, H3, and S3. So do we have my 12 outcomes? We do. So we're very happy. Thank you very much. Smiley face. And let's answer some questions. Draw a table to list the sample space of this experiment. Tick. Because the question says draw a table, that's what we have to do. If you just did the sample space with all the curly brackets and did A1, T1, H1, S1 and carried on, sadly, that would be incorrect because the question was specific. Okay, how many outcomes does the experiment have? Well, we can write that down straight away, 12. In fact, we didn't even need to draw the table to do that because we have the information in the question. Find the probability of getting the combination 2s. Now again, remember, order isn't important. So 2s is exactly the same as s2. How many of these table have s2 in them? Well, there's only one. Add a total of 12 outcomes, and there is my answer. Find the probability of an odd number being spun and the letter h. So we're looking for the letter h and an odd number. Well, there is an odd number, and there is an odd number. How many did I choose? I chose 2 out of 12, which when we cancel it down, gives us 1 out of 6. And a reminder, you should always cancel down fractions or simplify or whatever the terminology is, because sadly, if you don't do that in an exam, you tend to lose marks. Okay, I'm done. That's the end of this video. I look forward to seeing you next time.